Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of the Comre podcast series, founded by Radiant Life Technologies. Uh, my name is Mikhail Cvetanov. I'm uh, Partners Marketing Manager at Radiant Life Technologies, and I'm the host of this brand new series that we are just launching right now. You can find us on all major pod podcast platforms and social, social media platforms. And if you wish to stay in touch, press that subscribe button or follow button right now and become part of our community. I'm thrilled to introduce my very first guest to the Comra podcast series, Dr. Arjan Sorozakov. Arjan is a research scientist from Altai, South Siberia in Russia. He's the Director of Research and Development at Radiant Love Techno uh, Life Technologies, the company that has developed Comra therapy. And Arjan joined Trident Life Technologies back in 2009 as a result of his search for a life support division for science and technology. And we'll be talking more about that today. Since uh, Arjan joined Trident Life Technologies, he has been researching the science and application of Comra therapy. And through his research, he has come to a firm belief in the ability of human beings to co create health and well being uh, when they approach healing with knowledge care and love. We'll be talking with Arjan today about his vision for a different approach of science and technology and try to dig deeper into the basis of his belief in the capability of human beings to create health and well-being in their life and about Comer therapy. Arjan, finally, hello after that introduction. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, hello, Mihail. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it is exciting topics you, you listed there <laughs> yeah i'm so very curious i'm very curious arjan to discuss all that uh, with you i'm very curious to introduce to our listeners a little bit more about your vision about your philosophy and approach to life um, which i know a little bit about uh, but i hope that i'll get to know you even better today um, so let's jump into the deep water right away um, and can you please uh, start by elaborating a little bit more on uh, what is that life supporting vision for science and technology of yours that actually you have been searching for and which has led you on this fantastic journey you have been having with Comrade Therapy and with Radin Life Technologies throughout the last almost 13 years? Yes. Uh, well, since we are starting on this huge, enormous topic and there are so many issues involved. Let's keep it really, really simple. And that's what one of the really uh, hallmarks of life supportive technology and life supportive science is to actually to keep it as simple as possible. It goes directly to the, to the issue. So to keep it simple, science and technology that enhances quality of all of life it's that simple so that science and that technology that enhances quality of all of life that would be life supportive okay um what do you think or do you think in general there are many such technologies today because we are in a technological age when technology is all around us and of course, all producers and developers of technology, they claim that they introduce different technologies in order to simplify um, and somehow improve the life of people. But can we call all those technologies life supportive? We have to look at the results. We may play different word games and claim, as you correctly said, all kinds of things, you know, this new gadget will make your life simpler. This new gadget, this technology will improve your life. But we have to look at the results. What is the end result of application of this technology? And I must say, uh, it is exceedingly rare technology, which I can fully say, you know, it's a 
life supportive technology now it's exceedingly rare so i began my search uh, for this vision for such approach from just a common standard academic uh, science when i was working at uh, at the university in russia then in the us uh you know just the usual approach to science and there was no notion of oh this science is life supported this science is life destructive it's nothing like that it's just you know you get grant i mean if you're good enough you get a grant and you study or research something and you put forward some idea and if idea seems to be good and can bring some profit some benefit it goes into the practice you know it's implemented in some technology and that's it as long as there is a uh, profit involved or it answers certain i don't know political gains for example uh then it just goes out there so there is no distinction whatsoever however deep in your guts you feel something is really off something is really off and when you look at the results of application of that science of that technology you just I mean, it's plain to see is actually life getting better quality of life uh for example i'll just start throwing some examples uh it's huge agricultural industry so you apply different technologies the gene modification the different fertilizers or different pesticides all kinds of different approaches to get uh to, to produce grain milk meat and so on and so on and you know obviously we need it we need more foods but let's look at the result and again to keep it really simple is quality of soil improving is quality of food improving is quality of water that surrounds those fields is improving it's a really simple measure so when you apply this uh test and you, you need to look again at every uh aspect of life which comes under influence of that technology and you simply check you know before and after is its quality getting better I mean, besides, uh, okay, we got lots of grain, we got lots of food, we have, you know, overabundance actually of food right now. But if you look at every aspect of life, every form of life, uh, its quality of that life is improving. And the answer is no, 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 no. The same in medicine. Yes, no doubts. You know this fantastic latest technologies i mean well, i mean mostly it's 20th century uh in the field of uh critical medicine surgery diagnostics i mean who can question those advances absolutely not the lifespan across the world have dramatically expanded uh so all is good but then let's apply the same test let's look at the quality of life is it actually improving and you'll be surprised Mikhail if you look at the statistics you look at the studies and this is going on in the developed countries since let's say early 90s actually quality of life burden of disease is dropping meaning quality of life is decreasing burden of disease is going up so yes people are living longer than let's say 100 years ago absolutely but with what quality 
is it actually there so it's a really simple test and again you need to take into account all aspects of life all forms of life and, and it's plain to see even if in the beginning we can play words and we can uh talk about i don't know economical gains political gains years of life lived tons of grain produced all kinds of metrics and it's fine this is it's part of life uh but at the end of the day we have to look at the quality you know listening to you uh what comes up uh, for me um uh, is that what you describe is quite a different approach and understanding of what actually life is and what life means um because you as you are speaking you are describing a very complex conglomerate or an ecosystem of different aspects um and my feeling is that you know when i ask you the question what is life supportive let's say many people would actually um somehow understand that in terms of the life of the human being as an individual but what you are describing actually is something which is much more complex and interconnected it means that my understanding of what life supportive technology would be as according to what you explain is a technology that actually is very carefully thought over uh in, in in the direction of how it will be behaving and impacting not the particular area that ha it has been developed for you know let's say i don't know clean water you know but okay clean water but how the whole process of clean water will function how it will impact the whole network or the whole range of different parts that are including included into the um into the process and then only actually we start to think in terms of being really life supportive in a global way otherwise we are thinking like individual individual in an individualized way separate in a separative way we're thinking just about one particular problem that we want to to um, to uh, solve but we are not thinking about actually the greater impact our uh, in innovation or technology would have am i on the right track in my understanding that's of another describe. way how to describe it uh a life supportive technology is a technology or science that works based on interrelatedness of all of life it is actually standing on the very foundation of these technologies is because all of life is interrelated so once those relationships are gaining in quality are improved somehow the relationship between one and the another soil and water plant and soil human health soil health water quality air quality even the microbiome in our gut everything so those technologies that are improving based on those interrelationships they support life by design but if some technology works by taking away from one part trying to gain or compensate lack of something in the other part it could work temporarily for i don't know for some years maybe for a few decades you take away from one part but what you're doing actually you are drawing that one part you are exhausting it and as it becomes exhausted and it becomes destroyed <laughs> it's self-evident because you are depending on it now you end up also with bad quality of life so you cannot destroy one part without affecting the other so it's a science and technology of interrelatedness of interconnected and interactive world how this would be different to what um, we are calling today sustainability and i feel there is a difference um, right uh, look there is a political 
jargon about sustainability. And when it began with the uh, conference in Rio de Janeiro in early 90s, uh, the, the initial idea was correct. Meaning uh, every unit of life should be self-sustaining. Because if you look at the evolution of life on the planet, every species on the planet has to become, has to evolve you know, to be uh, self-sustaining and self-sufficient in the context of its environment. This is absolute requirement. This is a, one of the fundamental principles of life, actually. So in the same way, our human society, meaning uh, an individual, a family, you know, uh, a city or a country, they have to be self-sustaining and self-sufficient. They have to be uh, become strong on their own two feet. And this is how complex systems are being built. When each individual part is self-sufficient. So uh, the initial idea that was introduced into uh, in, in modern language was very good, actually, that many governments have realized it and actually announced that this is where we want to get to. But then, as usual, it's all got corrupted. And now it's just total, uh, how to say, total misdirection, miscommunication, misperception of what is self-sufficiency. No, self-sufficiency is very simple. It's plain to see. If you can feed yourself, if you can grow your food, if you can educate yourself, if you can get knowledge by yourself, if you can take care of your own health by yourself, this is true self-sufficiency. Then your family becomes self-sufficient. Then your neighborhood will become self-sufficient. That's how you build a resilient, strong, flourishing uh, communities when they are self-sufficient and self-reliant. But again, not in a sense of isolation, like on an island. Again, you know, at the expense of you know the big, bigger, uh, big environment and bigger context. No, it has to be in the context of the community and bigger community and bigger community. But you have to start with yourself, with your, as in being a, a human being, and 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 so on. So it's really a key concept you have there, Mikhail. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Arjan. Um, I think this uh, was a very good introduction into the topic because I really felt that it's it's um, very important to explain, elaborate a little bit more on what life supportive is and how do you use the term and what it means so that uh, our listeners and viewers can um, can understand our following discussion in that context. You mentioned, uh, Arjan, something about your background, um, and I would like to touch upon that as well, because I'm really curious to understand um, more about where did you actually come in touch for the first time in science and where this, and where this curios curiosity that I know you, you have actually has been developed and, when, and created how how did it, all uh, it was very simple Mikhail. i was climbing uh, here in altai mountains with my father he was uh, uh, painting you can see all his paintings in here in altai and I, I was just spending time with him and you know because he was standing for hours and hours in one place and just busy painting <laughs> i was just climbing over the rocks going to that mountain to that river and i spent enormous amount of time just in the woods no, in the woods in the mountain and I just found it fascinating. Well, first for me, it was sports like rock climbing, mountaineering. And then I went to uh, uh, study geography and uh, global climate at the Tomsk State University here in Russia. And after that, I went on to a PhD program at the University of Idaho in Moscow, uh, U.S., where I started to study the interrelated, again, nature of everything what's going on in mountain ecosystems, 
And this is where I came across how tightly everything is interconnected. I'm talking about the climate, water, forest, plants, and the human life and how they affect each other. I studied uh, high mountains in Central Asia, Tianshan, Altai, Pamir Mountains. Then we had big project on the Aral Sea and how basically we managed just to destroy enormous regional ecosystem. Uh, you obviously know what's, uh, what happened to the Aral Sea in Central Asia, it was basically uh, destroyed. Uh, so this was my introduction to more and more and more complex systems, uh, how they are interrelated. And as a scientist, uh, I looked at trying to model, trying to understand how to, how to measure, how to mathematically describe all these enormous complexities, enormous complexities. So I was exposed to the problems. I went there, meaning I didn't just sit with the books at the, you know, at the university. No, we actually went to... Uh, countless expeditions. We walked on feet uh, up into the mountains. We installed uh, weather stations. We climbed in the glaciers. We took samples. We drilled ice cores on the highest places uh, in Central Asia. Uh, 5,000 meters, 5,500 meters. So this was very hard work. But for me, it was exciting. I was out in the field. I was out there you know, touching it. I was climbing on the mountains. I was, see I was seeing for myself what's going on, you see. I was talking to all of these people and I would see why, you know, what's involved. And for me, it was like a, a split. So on one hand, I'm doing science, which is well and good. And we're being funded by National Science Foundation, by NASA. I mean, it's very good. You know, I'm just enjoying time of my life. On the other hand, I see these people in uh, living in the villages, in mountain villages and the economic situation, how how they have to fight to to survive. You see, and for me it was the disconnect. Okay, so here's my science, and here are the people who are living there. But how is my science helping them? Maybe it was a naive question, but for me, I felt you know the enormous disconnect. If I'm doing something, and this is something that is really important, but then why it's not being applied to the everyday life? And this is, I felt just frustration. Uh, I started seeking for a way, you know, there have to be different way because I felt that science is my calling. I loved doing it. I just felt the, mm -hmm. you know, the inspiration. I felt the desire to go out and study and understand how it all works, how it's all happening. But then, it doesn't apply to day-to-day -day life of people around me. So, and this is why I started to look. And this is how I came across uh, my friends at Radio Life Technologies. And when I came and I saw, you know, as you know, Mikhail, uh, what comer therapy is, the principles behind comer therapy, I was stunned. I was stunned, I tell you, Mikhail. Uh, basically, I felt I'm the luckiest person alive because I'm actually witnessing something of such beauty, such beauty. It, it was as if I'm studying the earth like I was doing before, you know, I was st st studying systems. But now I'm looking at the human body as a system which consists of very, very similar processes. So what I'm dealing with is a system of relationships. And Comra as a technology basically beautifully illustrated that idea that once we strengthen those relationships in the body, it will become more and more self-sufficient. It will start repairing itself much more efficiently, eventually becoming healthy again. So that blew my mind as a scientist because you know I've seen what we can do, how we destroy things around us, and I've seen it again and again and again and again. 
And typically, as a scientist, as a geographer, I was looking at the planet, at the forest, at the lakes, at the uh, glaciers. And all I've seen was pretty much one thing, which is it was better before in 50s and 60s and 70s. And then it got worse and worse and worse. And by 2000, 2010, you know, we pretty much destroyed what we could get our hands on. So that was really upsetting. I mean, I just felt, you know, something is really not working here, like, like really not working fundamentally. So when I look at Comer therapy, when I looked at um, what it does and why it works, oh, I felt like, okay, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm going all in. So I left behind my Korean geography <laughs> Uh, in global climate change, in uh, systems uh, science. And I jumped in uh, uh, into healing, into medicine, into studying how um, tightly, tightly woven fabric of life works, but on a smaller scale, which is, a let's say, a human organism, a human body. So that was my journey. Arjan, Arjan, I'm I'm really fascinated by by this story of yours, um, and I can clearly see you know the connections and this red line that goes through your life because, you know, if someone basically just got to know you and you tell him about your scientific background and what you are doing today, the first reaction would be, but these two areas are not connected at all. But you just described it in a in a such a such a lively way, uh, which makes absolutely sense. And before even you went to um, and get to um, got to comrade therapy and to healing, I could I could see it, you know basically the connections because it is exactly as you described it. I mean, you've been studying this all these different systems in the nature, seeing seeing how they interact how the interrelationships between them are, how are they how they are interdependent. And I mean there is at the end of the day this saying or an expression that the microcosm uh, cosmos uh, or yeah cosmos reflects the the the, um, the macrocosmos or cosm. And and I can see it here as well. I mean it's uh, so this was an extremely good preparation for your next chapter of uh, as as a scientist um and yeah i mean like in comparison to like the, the the general approach of medicine today when there is this ultra specialization of even doctors medical doctors specializing on one one organ of the body not even a system but like one organ of the body and that's what i do all day you know i'm 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 healing kidneys and i don't touch anything else uh it presupposes that you know, this approach would never be complex and it would not be the life supportive approach as you described it at the beginning, because it's not taking care, um, not taking in consideration the rest of the system, basically. So I'm really fascinated by, by, by you know, how life have, um, has prepared, you know, this, this road and this journey for you to get you finally into, into the area of, um, of healing and working with the human body and you actually looking at it in the same or similar way and using your knowledge and experience from uh, from your um, uh, geographical or um, yeah uh, whatever you call your science area that you used to be at uh, maybe you can help me with the word that's correct you know, that's correct to, you can call it geography area. but now i'm just studying geography of microcosm same thing absolutely yeah yeah Fascinating, fascinating, really. Um, so you, you described, you know, I was curious to understand where you are recognizing that the science and um, like the the academic world today is, is lacking of, of, let's say, like a understanding or real understa understanding of, of the process of life. And I think you, you touched on that um, very well. Um, I know that, and I've heard you mentioning uh, before the, the expression true science. 
Can you elab elaborate a little bit more on what actually in that sense true science is? And isn't, isn't it what we kind of just touched upon already? Or uh, how science could actually become true again, let's say, because I believe that science once have been true. Yes, uh, there is such a phrase and sometimes I use it in my work, uh, true science, but then it means something is false science. <laughs> okay, so let's be clear. Uh, um, there is a scientific method. There is nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. Anybody can use scientific method. Uh, it's plain to use. It's working and it will be working for thousands of years, for millennia. Uh, it's just basically how we learn about the world, that scientific method. Now, what do we do with it? How do we decide what to study, how to study, how to apply that science, and which technologies to build? So, And we talked about, let's say, life-supportive technologies and so on, life-destructive technologies. Uh, but behind it, is a deeper layer of meaning when we say science because currently what's happening in science i'm talking about let's say at the university level at research institute level what they do and describe as science is basically regurgitating the same old same if you remember early 20th century the breakthroughs in science, what's happening. If you remember the great scientists of the past, they would have spontaneous illumination of fantastic idea, which ushers totally new era. Like, for example, Nikola Tesla. He would have an inspiration and then he would be guided by his feeling in order to get to something which never existed before. And if we talk about inventions in early 20th century, if you talk about, let's, for example, for example, Nobel Prizes uh, in physics uh, in that uh, early 20th century, every discovery was uh, truly, truly magnificent. Uncovering something totally unheard of before. And that would completely bring a new quality of life, completely new way of relating to, to the world, of communication, of energy, of food, of health, you name it. But as we go further and further later in the 20th century, and especially now, it's just same old same. Never a new idea. And it was another thing that drive me nuts uh, back in the... Uh, academic science is that uh well pretty much everybody was doing the same for the last 20 30 40 years not a single new idea there's no inspiration it's just a rational mind going over and over the same tracks we would be studying something highlighting some detail maybe um studying a little bit more of that, applying the same method to similar situation, but pretty much it's already known. So it's not so much science. It's it's more like, a, you know, when you just, uh, it's like a tool, like you're digging with a shovel, one pit and you dig another pit and you dig another pit. That's it. It's just a mechanistic application of the same tool to maybe it's a slightly different area, but there is nothing truly new in it. True science come from inspiration. True science come from feeling. When you go there and you grasp something, and even you don't know what it is, but you start experimenting, and you start trying to get a feel for it, how it's working, how it's relating to the world, what's what it's calling you for. You see? And this is true science. Now, I can't say uh, I have invented myself something fantastic and great uh, like Nikola Tesla. However, uh, 
I was observing how Comra therapy, again, I'll talk about Comra, came about. And that was inspiration. And I've seen this process happening step by step by step by step and how uh, my friends, the engineers, the scientists, uh, uh, Theon, the founder of our company, how he was inspired, how our group was inspired. And as we went further and further, that inspiration, that friendship, bring out something exciting, something truly new. Uh, so that's true science. That's true science. You mentioned uh, a few times the word feeling. And I would say that knowing scientists and the way how they think, um, I would say that this is a word which they don't usually, they are not much, they are not in like in fancy, fancy of, you know, I mean, how can I, how, how can I feel uh, through some invention, you know, and, 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 and take me to, to some, to something, to some, to somehow to completion of that innovation. I mean, I need to sit down as a scientist and calculate everything, you know, and, and it needs to have a logic. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a poet, you know, to feel <laughs> how, how, how you can, how you can explain a little bit more what is what is that feeling and how to work with that with that feeling and how it actually pertains to and belongs to to science look if you're talking about again the uh, true science the breakthrough science some science something that uh, uncovers truly new knowledge that improves quality of all of life and i'm highlighting new knowledge what but what does it mean new knowledge it means it didn't exist before. So how would you know of something that didn't exist before? Rational mind is a computer, is a calculator. It only can compute and calculate something which it already knows. That's the function of rational mind. That's the microscope, super powerful microscope. It can zoom in and do precise calculations, but you never create something new using your rational mind. You can only direct it and say, okay, sit down and calculate these things for me, please. And that's what rational mind does. It's its job. But if we're talking about creating something new, creating a new technology, bring out a new invention or a new concept or a a truly new scientific principle. I mean, how would you access it if you, it doesn't exist yet? You have to follow your gut feel. And if you read any book about a great scientist, they actually, maybe, maybe uh, they will not even admit to themselves, but in reality, they were tapping into that internal uh, space of creativity they would get curious and they would follow their gut feel and they would work in the darkness trying to find their way uh, working with that concept with that concept trying to change things but they're being guided by feeling all the time I mean simple example if there was no airplane before how the brothers, uh, Wright brothers, created, uh, invented the airplane. Yeah, right. Because nobody before them uh, invented the idea, so they have to come up with it somehow. So they had to conceive this idea that's even possible in the first place. And then, how would you come across doing it? Well, again, you have to kind of do crazy stuff. And you just you follow you follow your guts, you follow your feeling, and then one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, and then boom, you have something which kind of works. It sort of flies, maybe not the best way, but it demonstrates the principle. Then you work some more, then you work some more. This is where the rational mind is, you know, doing its fantastic job, but it has to follow the lead of our feeling, because. In reality, the world, the entire life is a feeling. 
everything is a feeling around us. We relate to life by feeling. We just mask it <laughs> later on through rational mind, which start to explain to us rational mind. Uh, this is the house. This is a room. This is a computer. I'm having an interview. But behind it is a feeling. We touch the world through feeling, like children do, for example. So a scientist, actually, a true scientist, mm -hmm. is actually uh, a crazy person, totally crazy person, not bound by any uh, rational assumption. He just goes out and does crazy stuff. But then he looks into it, and he, being a trained scientist, he now tries to implement it into something which is useful, something that improves quality of life. So, and then gradually a new technology would come up. Greatly explained. Uh, from what you are sharing, actually, I'm, I'm, yeah, I have the feeling that the science, science today, most of the science, because I believe they are through scientists around the world, which are approaching science uh, in a very similar way as you described, but science in general is most probably missing a lot on basically being afraid of relying on feeling and starting all its work and inventions, something which is called invention, uh, let's say, um, by, by pure logic which is actually the, the very reason why it leads to recreating, reinventing the same old things uh, or using the same old principles to just create something which looks on the surface like something new, but it's actually the, the same old thing just uh, in, a, in a new dress. That's what I'm, what I'm getting off uh, of what Correct. you just Correct. shared. Pretty much so, yeah. Arjan, you mentioned comrade therapy a few times. Um, how how did you get to know Comra? What what was how your journey with Comra started? Uh, well, if I come back to what I was sharing just uh, just before, I was still working at the university and I was looking for a different way forward for me as a scientist, and I came across uh, this group of people uh, who were exploring at different ways of relating to each other, to the self, to the world. And that was uh, for the work of Institute for the Study of Men. I started to attend the courses uh, run by Elizabeth Snuch. And this is where I started to question my perception of what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, uh, and working with uh, uh, Teun Mares, actually. And he started to help me because I was writing to him. My first questions were about, as I asked Teun, can you please help me to understand what science is? And he was giving me clues and hints and guidance. And then I was uh, started to get a feel for it, but maybe not very much practical. However, when... Comrade therapy was invented when it actually came across as an inspiration uh, in our group, actually. This is where I started to see aha. Because the field of medicine for me was totally new. Uh, but when I started to read more about uh, healing with different radiances. I'm talking about low-level laser, ultrasound, color, and magnetic fields. This is the four radiances we used in coma therapy. Um, and then trying to understand why they work even in the first place. Because you see, in a common paradigm, we have a disease, we have a problem, we want to eradicate eradicate the problem. Well, very simple. And now if you look at the comrade therapy, it doesn't er eradicate anything. And that was like, a, for me, totally new idea. How medi medical technology works 
if it does not eradicate anything, it does not eradicate pain, inflammation, uh, let's say a parasite, and so on and so on. Because it's almost automatic assumption in the uh, uh, current uh, mainstream medicine is that if something is really effective, it's really good medication, for example, oh, then it must be like have a long list of uh, contraindications, long list of side effects because it's a powerful medication. And the more the more the powerful the medication, the longer would be the list of side effects. So power means effectiveness, means it potentially can kill you actually because it's so powerful. So comrade therapy, when I got myself a comrade device, Delta, I started to use it on myself, I didn't feel anything. I just felt at my knees that I were in really bad shape after you know, a couple of decades in rock climbing and mountaineering in really bad shape. Basically, I had pain pretty much all the time in my knees. So a few weeks later, I start to forget I have pain in my knees until I realize I don't have it anymore. So I started to read more literature. I, I started to read more, uh, not only, let's say, uh, uh, clinical trials and how laser therapy works and the results, but why they work. And what I could find in the literature at the time is that uh, they would interpret action of those radiances in the same way as would action of, let's say, certain medication. They were trying to fit uh, something really different, which is healing with radiances into the same paradigm of healing with, let's say, pharmaceuticals. No, it felt wrong. I felt that uh, even though a lot of experimental results are fantastic, the clinical results are real and good, the explanation behind them doesn't really make much sense to me. I mean, I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, it's very well known that laser therapy have a very good pain relief uh, effect. Almost any type of pain, be it muscle pain, joint pain, headache, uh, and so on, different types of pain. You can put a low-level laser therapy device directly on the organ, on the joint, and then pain would subside. So automatic assumption, a lot of scientists wrote articles describing the effects, saying that uh, laser simply kills the pain. It makes the nerve less sensitive, just like would medication do. No, if you inject uh, a typical painkiller, how it works, it, it would block the signal from reaching your brain. No, I mean, I'm generalizing, but pretty much the, we're just blocking the pain signal. So by the same uh, token, if we apply a laser, it must uh, block pain signal. It must somehow inhibit transfer of electrical signal by chemical signal into the brain. But it doesn't make any sense because after we apply laser therapy, actually function of nerves, peripheral nerves, is improved, not, not decreased, not being blocked and so on. So a lot of, lot of contradictions and it didn't make any sense to me as I was reading the literature. So, and then I came back to the principles as I was discussing them with our friends at, at RLT. Um, coming back to the principles of life and starting to see, look, we're dealing something completely different. We cannot fit the ideas of comrade therapy into the same box of uh, how high-intensity devices work or pharmaceutical works. It's a totally different paradigm. Well, to be exact, this is a paradigm of life-supportive technologies because Comrade therapy works because it improves quality of life in a given cell, in the tissue, in the organ. It doesn't work by 
blocking pain by blocking inflammation or by enhancing or activating or stimulating certain process in the tissue in the body it only works by improving quality and i'm not talking about in the literal by physical sense by improving efficiency of certain processes in a cell see it's a totally different way of thinking so for me chromotherapy was practical introduction into this world of relating differently to life not by trying to force it manipulate it you know get control of it but rather stand back and acknowledge look there's intelligence in the cell there's intelligence in our body it knows what it does but it just needs our help it needs our true support and coma therapy literally supporting life in the cell in the organ in regenerating in rebuilding which is healing itself if i'll put it very very briefly mikhail that's how it works yeah well that's that's uh that's um completely completely yeah different approach from uh what the the general approach to healing the body would be and uh I feel it's the same the same as if, if I go back to um to what you were explaining about the ecosystems like the in geography out in the in the lands uh I see a similar approach when uh you know like humanity we as a humans are trying to come and to very invasively try to influence in some way the ecosystems in order to in our eyes to make them work better or to change something and we have all these machines and uh, all this technology which is very invasive and um, and basically it turns around the whole environment and the whole ecosystem and the idea behind is something like hey we're doing good but at the end of the day the result is not the same and um here with Comra, I see the, the same thing in comparison to what you were describing, for example, how how um, chemicals and drugs would work um, and, you know, based on power and based on uh, in, in invasiveness, the bigger the invasiveness, the better in a way, because we feel like we have control over the body. And, and then from there comes the aspect of, well, the body actually needs us, you know, I mean, the body, the body is completely... I wouldn't probably, I don't know if stupid is the right work, uh, word, but at the end of the day, that's how we approach it. The body is completely stupid. It needs us. And I mean, who we are, you know, I mean, it's, we are the same bodies actually not believing that we, uh, you know, our bodies have the, have the capability to, to heal uh, themselves and just needing a little bit of, of support to create that right environment in order to bring uh, to empower them back to what they are best in themselves um yeah uh, amazing to listen to and to connect all these all these dots um can you can you for those that are let's say more into logic what are the very processes that the Comra influences? Uh, you said they, the Comra impacts on, on a cellular level. It um, helps uh, the cell function better. It cooperates with it. Uh, what are the very processes that Comra influences? Okay, Mikhail, in, in let's, leave, let's use logic. <laughs> well, let's uh, look at the life of a cell. And let's ask ourselves a question. What cells need in order to prosper? What are those uh, fundamental requirements for a cell, a single cell, to uh, be heavy? It needs energy. This is like uh, biology 101. All of life needs energy. A cell needs energy in order to build itself. Because with every passing second, a cell, as it functions, it disintegrates it falls apart so in order to prevent that process it has to rebuild itself at the same time so a cell constantly needs 
flow of energy. And in a cell, there is a special uh, part of it called mitochondria. Those are tiny, tiny organelles, and they do a very important job. They synthesize uh, an energy currency in our body called ATP. And that tiny molecules carry energy. I mean, from the materialistic point of view, they carry energy to every part of the cell machinery. Now, if you look in the textbook, if you look at the articles that describe this uh, process of ATP synthesis and transfer of energy, let's say, look, you know, this is a process that's not really efficient. At best, it functions at 40% efficiency, meaning about 60% of energy goes out into the environment. And only 40% of the energy when oxygen and glucose come into the chemical reaction, they release energy. Most of it is lost into the environment. So the efficiency is not really high. And here come common therapy. Under certain conditions, specifically when we have a low-level laser and the magnetic field with double efficiency of ATP synthesis. We are creating a state of physical coherence and to be exact, quantum coherence when the process of ATP synthesis occurring at much, much bigger efficiency. Well, basically we double. And this is why experimentally already in early 90s it has been established that when you apply low-level laser light suddenly there is so much more atp in a cell but again to keep things really simple it doesn't mean that we pump the cell full of energy using a laser and life no, it doesn't work like that obviously no but uh why then energy uh, why do we measure more available energy in a cell where it came from this extra energy it came only because the internal cellular machinery is functioning at higher efficiency i'll give you an example you take 10 people put them on a boat give them uh, and ask them to start row together in a boat if they start rowing not in sync or maybe even different direction and <laughs> the boat will not go anywhere uh even though individually they will be applying top effort really you know trying their best so they have to start work in sync right those area one of those 10 people so when they start rowing together one two one two one, two, they're doing it synchronously. So their individual efforts would come together. Then the boat will speed up so much faster. So the same happening in the cell when we create conditions of coherence, then a cell has much more energy. So that's requirement number one. Requirement number two, every cell has to rebuild itself in the process of regeneration and in order to do that it's a huge logistical problem a cell has to bring in nutrients it has to move them around in a cell really fast in proper places and then it has to expel uh, those bits and pieces that are no longer needed inside the cell so uh, any cell is uh, like a hub transport hub it has to move across different particles all the time but uh, the uh, environment in a cell is very dense it's packed and especially if cell is diseased you know it's sick it's like a swamp everything sits in one place and not moving anywhere so a cell is trying to rebuild itself but everything is going across really smooth so we add little bit of mechanical vibration with ultrasound 
just to make things move across faster. So that's the second requirement. With the ultrasound in camera therapy, we are increasing speed of every type of transport inside the cell, outside the cell, and so on. And the third requirement is we need to talk to the cell. We need to converse with that intelligence. I mean, how would you converse with the cell, right? <laughs> it doesn't understand English or Russian. Or... No, it does understand a language of color, a language of light. Actually, every living being understands language of light. I mean, basic, simple example. When sun is up, our body functions. Sun is down, we're sleeping. Right? That's a language. It's a natural language. We, we have evolved in an environment where every single cell responds to light. But I'm talking about two specific now colors or wavelengths of light. With red light, we stimulate. With blue light, we relax and slow down. And yellow green, we rebalance. So when we apply the three colors in sequence, we're talking to the cell, asking it to start rebuilding itself. Because in this sequence, when we apply these colors in sequence, we're basically going through, let's say, night and day, night and day, night and day. So we're conversing with the cell, asking it to rebuild itself. So when we put together energy, transport of, of meta and conversation with the intelligence. That's what we did using coma therapy. We created an environment of harmony, of coherence, in which a cell which is temporarily not functioning, you know, on top of its capacity, now starts functioning much more and it doesn't matter what kind of cell it could be a muscle cell heart cell it could be a brain cell it doesn't matter what kind of cell or even what kind of organism for that matter because we're we're working at a much more fundamental level not the level of biology not the level of biochemistry we're working at the level of biophysics at the very 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 bottom of the uh of this machine uh, machinery if I'll, if I'll use that word so with common therapy we're creating those conditions we're enhancing quality of interrelationships inside a given cell and once a cell starts to work properly and the neighbor cell and the community of cells the entire organ starts to you know function properly the entire system is now functioning properly and now the entire body is waking up and it's busy repairing itself. As simple as that. So you just described the secret behind what many starting users have been very curious about and very concerned about. How there could be a user guide, user manual, um, with, I don't know, more than 200 protocols for basically healing so many different conditions and you just described the key. So we are not after the condition. We are after the improvement of how the cells as such work in the different communities which are connected in some way to that particular disease or condition that we are trying to improve. Am I correct in my thinking? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because we're not trying to fight a specific disease, a specific pathology, let's say fight the pain, fight inflammation in the knee, for example. We're not doing that at all with karma therapy. We're just helping a cell to rebuild itself, a tissue to regenerate itself, an organ to resume its normal function. And we don't have to know how it's doing it. We don't have to control and manipulate exact specifics for that particular organ in that particular uh, situation. We don't have to have that knowledge. As long as we know which organ is involved, which tissue is asking for help, we place the device directly 
on the organ and we switch switch it on and those radiances go deep into the body and as they reach those cells that are stressed they're diseased they're sick they're traumatized so those radiances come into those cells and the cells start to rebuild themselves two three times more efficiently and that's the beauty of, of common therapy because again if we're coming back to the beginning of our conversation is that uh we're helping an individual person to become self-sufficient in their own health how well very simple you have to just learn to listen to your body you need to be aware which part of your body needs care which part of your body needs support you have pain you have an ache you have sort of discomfort you put device on that organ i mean if we use it very very simply you put common device on top of it and of course if, if you have a more complex disease you have a diagnosis then yes you would go to the user guide you open the book you would see all the points uh, because uh, if disease is, has progressed then it usually many many uh, organs are involved but behind it and that's what again the simplicity and the beauty of comer behind it is a very simple idea you put the device directly where your body is asking for support that's it as simple as that perfect perfect thank you very much for that uh, detailed explanation maybe if i if i just um ask you one more question here um uh... Can you give an example of how do you personally have been using Comra in your daily life? In what ways? Uh, Michael, actually, it, I don't even notice now, maybe. Because I don't remember being sick or ill for quite a number of years. Well, let's say uh, last week I was at a conference. I had lots of meetings and... Uh, a lot of conversations i gave a presentation i worked late nights maybe for a couple of weeks and even though energetically i felt super excited as a supercharged i felt uh because lack of sleep you know my body's kind of start to tap into the uh into my battery i felt no i need a little bit in our care so i did uh universal five that's comer therapy protocol you put a device on your brain on your head your your uh, carotid arteries other points on the body with involves uh, with the bloodstream so i did it maybe two three four times and that's it i was again top notch so i'm not applying it in a sense of let's say you know have a specific disease or pain and then i have to treat myself it's just sensing oh, okay today my head maybe needs a bit of a help because i'm taxing the resources <laughs> quite heavily then i don't want to wait until i'm sick until i have a headache for example and then i'll be treating myself now i just felt you know i'm actually a bit off and i understand why you know it's a week of preparation before the conference then conference itself and late night conversations uh so just preemptive preemptively prophylactically i would apply comra and and because i've been using it for so many years i wouldn't say i have anything like major as a major disease i, I try to aim it preemptively before it's getting into a disease stage as such right right I would uh, use the opportunity here to mention um, to all listeners and viewers that um, if you have been interested and curious to understand more about Comra and its, its implications, um, you can go to www.comra-therapy.com and you can get much more information beyond what uh, Arjan just shared and you can check as well as well the resources um, area section on the webpage where there are actually a lot of different uh, case studies and um, uh, testimonials of users so that you can get a better feeling about how you can be eventually using and applying comrade therapy 
uh, into your daily life and as well as explore all the different ways how Comra can be applied through the different devices that Radiant Life Technologies offer. Arjan, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's been really a great conversation so far. Um, we'll be we'll be having uh, heading towards the uh, closure of, of that discussion. I would have a few closing questions um, to you. Um, one of them, uh, we spoke about a lot about um, your view on life, on, on science, uh, life supportive technologies and so on. If you happen to get superpowers uh, as a human being, um, as a superhero in a cartoon, what would be that one thing in the world that you would use your superpowers um, to change, to make it different? I think I would be a, a director of R and D at RLT. I think I would have a superpower of having a a device, a technology, with my friends, and you can apply this device to pretty much any health problem, and it would just work. I think I would do that actually. As far as the, so the superhero, a superpower, and then. And what you would change in the world. That's right. What I would change in the world. Um, What I would change in the world. Hmm. I would say it's, it's fantastic and beautiful as is. It is a stunningly beautiful place. It never ceases to amaze me what's around the corner next day and next week and next month. So it's just so beautiful. I enjoy every single day of what's going on in my life. I feel very privileged. And even having this conversation with you, Mikhail. So I will change nothing. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you, Arjan. Um, so Arjan, where from where to from here? What are your plans, nearest plans? What are the plans ahead with, with comrade therapy and, and and so on and in your scientific research? Uh, it's quite a number of areas. Uh, I'll mention one because it's coming sort of the conclusion is uh, working with animals and applying comrade therapy to animals. This is a hugely rewarding, hugely rewarding area because Comra works beautifully with dogs, with cats, with horses, with cows, and we know it works. So we, we've we been working throughout the summer this year and actually, actually the entire 2023 to uh, build a user guide for animals, uh, domestic animals. So this is the next step and um, uh, we're working on uh, concluding this uh, development um and i'm just very very happy that we bring this technology to animals it changes in a dramatic way the quality of life for the animal for the owner of the animal because sometimes they are just part of the human family like a child you know so i've seen just so many many uh testimonials and feedback from the uh, pet owners that I felt this is what Comra enables us to do is to address disease, pain, suffering, to help bring wellness, not just to human beings, but animals as well. Remember we talked about bringing quality to all of life. And for me, our this next step working with animals is that uh, manifestation that we're actually looking with now, now another species with animals with cats and dogs it's so we're bringing in more and more and more well that's another fascinating aspect of comrade therapy actually because um, uh, if you take it uh, the human or the, the the human organism and the pet organism the animal organism they work on a very similar basis 
and uh, going to that depth of um, of uh, biological functioning that you described where a comer operates at, uh, the cells actually operates exactly in the same way. And that's fascinating how you can use mm. comer for healing as well your, your pet friends, uh, as opposed to, let's say, typical uh, veterinary drugs, which are obviously different than what you would use for human being. So that's absolutely amazing. Arjan, uh, my closing question to you uh, would be, uh, what would be the message they that we would like to leave here in the podcast for all health seekers around the world? Mikhail, I would say a message is very simple, is to try for yourself uh, chromotherapy. It's very simple. Uh, it may not be easy to grasp with the logic if you especially know a lot from the previous uh, medical training or you've been upset and you tried every method under the sun and it's easy to get discouraged, disillusioned and really, you know, there's so many gadgets out there. So understanding all of that, I still would urge to try. Try for yourself. Ask others who have tried and then make a decision for yourself because when, until I actually tried myself and I physically experienced the effect on my own body, it's all intellectual. You know, it's all, somebody says something, even if it's a scientific paper, a clinical trial that says, you know, those benefits and those, those benefits, until you actually try it for yourself, and you sense that well-being in you growing, nothing is comparable. So that's the simple message. Just go out and try it. And I would add that uh, all of you, our listeners and, and viewers, um, if you are interested to get to know uh, more about Comra Therapy, I will repeat the web address, which is www.comra, as written as C-O-M-R-A, dash therapy.com where you can explore how Comra works you can explore as well all the devices um, that um, are actually on uh, offer there and um, if you wish to get more information from uh, from a live person as well you can contact uh, our chat support uh, which is directly on the web page or you can research through the uh, local representatives which we have around the world and contact some of them and, and go try Comra on yourself. Dr. Arjan Surazakov, PhD, was our special guest today. Arjan, thank you very much one more time for the beautiful discussion and for being a guest in our very first episode of the Comra Therapy Series. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, I really appreciate you staying with us till the end. Uh, if you wish to stay in touch and not miss out of uh, on our next episodes, press that subscribe or follow button right now and become power, part of our community. I'm Mikhail Svetanov and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next episode of our Comrade podcast series. Thank you. Good health. Bye-bye.